Hi there, welcome back to AP Chemistry. My name is Jeremy Krug, and in this video, we're continuing with more of topic 3.1, which is about intermolecular and interparticle forces. If you're new to my channel, welcome. Hope you like what you see. Check out the playlists. That's where the action is here. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button if you like what you see. If you're really serious about learning AP Chemistry, don't forget to subscribe and think about getting my ultimate review packet for AP Chemistry if uh, you are serious about being successful on the AP chemistry exam. Now, in the last video, we talked about London dispersion forces. In this video, we're going to add in several other important intermolecular and interparticle forces. And the first one that I want to show you here is called dipole-dipole forces. So let's imagine that we have a molecule of hydrogen chloride, HCl. Now we know that chlorine is much more electronegative than hydrogen is. And so because of that, there's kind of a lopsidedness to the electron distribution here. And this is a polar molecule, just as we learned back in Unit 2, if you draw out the Lewis electron dot diagram for this. In fact, we can say that there is a partial negative pole on the side that has the chlorine and a partial positive pole on the side that has the hydrogen. So there's a lopsidedness here. There's a polarity to this molecule. So what that means is if we have several of these HCl molecules next to each other, well, if we have that polarity on all of those molecules, there's an attraction between the positive pole on one molecule and the negative pole of its neighbor. So basically, we know that positives and negatives attract each other. So this positive pole over here on this molecule, for example, is going to have an attraction to the negative pole on this molecule. So like this, basically, there's an attraction right there. There's an attraction right there. And that attraction is called a dipole-dipole force. And this is found only in polar molecules. So as we talk about dipole-dipole forces, once again, it's only polar molecules that are going to exhibit these dipole-dipole forces. Now, just so you know, we're not leaving out London dispersion forces. Polar molecules and all molecules, all substances, exhibit London dispersion forces. However, polar molecules also have dipole-dipole forces as well. So in the case of polar molecules, they have both dipole-dipole and London dispersion forces. And generally speaking, everything being equal, we say that dipole-dipole forces are usually stronger than London dispersion forces. If you have similar numbers of electrons somewhere in the same neighborhood, usually we'll say that the polar molecule is going to have stronger intermolecular forces. And as a result, the polar molecule usually has the higher boiling point than the nonpolar molecule if you're comparing those. So let's say we have this question. Which of these molecules has the higher boiling point? We have nitrogen trichloride, and then we have the C4H10 molecule, which is called uh, butane. Well, we know that C4H10 is a nonpolar molecule. So the only forces that this is going to exhibit would be London dispersion forces, kind of weak. On the other hand, NCl3, if you were to draw that out, you'd find that it is a polar molecule. So it's going to have both London dispersion forces and dipole-dipole forces. So we would expect NCl3 to have the higher boiling point, and it absolutely does. In fact, if you were to Google this, you'd find that nitrogen trichloride has a boiling point much higher than that of butane, like 71 degrees Celsius compared to negative 1 degree Celsius. Now let's move on and talk about another type of intermolecular force. This one is called hydrogen bonding. Now to think about hydrogen bonding, let's imagine we have a molecule of water. Now here's water. It has this you know, HOH uh, shape, essentially. It has a bent configuration or a bent geometry, as we learned back in Unit 2. And we know that this is a very polar molecule. And this is because, uh, first of all, it has a lopsided electron distribution, but oxygen also has a very high electronegativity. And so because of this, we have a polarity. There's a negative pole over here on the side with the oxygen and those two uh, unshared electrons, those two lone pairs over here. And the positive pole would be on the side that has the hydrogen. So we can draw the partial polarity like this, the delta positives and the delta negative down here. Now, 
if we were to have another water molecule nearby, we know that there would be an attraction, right? There'd be an attraction between the negative pole of a water molecule and the positive pole of its neighbor, kind of like this. And so you might call that a dipole-dipole force because it's essentially the same thing we had in the last example. However, there's something special about this particular intermolecular force. It sure looks like a dipole-dipole force, but really it's something kind of uh, different because hydrogen is a very, very tiny atom. In fact, hydrogen is basically pretty much the tiniest atom you're ever going to have uh, in a molecule. And because of that, it allows the oxygen on the neighboring molecule to get really close to it. And so we're talking about molecules that are really smashed close to each other. And oxygen is also a very small atom as well. And so whenever we have a bunch of water molecules, they can get really, really close to each other. And based upon Coulomb's law, we know that the closer molecules are to each other, the stronger their intermolecular forces are going to be. And so this is not just some plain old dipole-dipole force. This is what we call a hydrogen bond. This is a very strong intermolecular force. And so when we talk about hydrogen bonding, we can define it as a very strong type of dipole-dipole force that's found in molecules that contain an oxygen-hydrogen bond, a nitrogen-hydrogen bond, or a fluorine-hydrogen bond. Now, the most common ones that we're going to see are oxygen-hydrogen, just like we saw in the water molecule, and nitrogen-hydrogen. Now, fluorine-hydrogen is not as common, but that counts as well. But if you see any one of those three bonds in a molecule, we know that that molecule is going to exhibit hydrogen bonding. And generally speaking, hydrogen bonds are stronger than London dispersion forces or just plain old dipole-dipole forces. This also helps us to explain why if you have a polar molecule that has you know, fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen on it, it's probably going to dissolve in water. The reason for that is that the molecule can actually hydrogen bond with water itself. And so it's able to have that attraction and it dissolves into water quite readily. So let's take a look at this example. Which of these molecules exhibits hydrogen bonding? Well, we have two molecules here. We have NO2 and we have NH3. If you were to draw out NO2, you'd find that it is a polar molecule. So it has London dispersion forces and dipole-dipole forces. But NH3 is a polar molecule, but it also has that NH bond in it. And so it has London dispersion forces, but it also has hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding is generally stronger. So we'd say that, yeah, NH3 exhibits hydrogen bonding and NO2 does not. So let's take a look at this next question here. It says a chemistry student observes that NH3 ammonia gas readily dissolves in water while pH3 gas does not. Explain this phenomenon in terms of intermolecular forces. Now, we'll talk about solubility later in Unit 3, but here we can see that we have a molecule that has nitrogen in it, and this is a polar molecule. So this is telling us that NH3 is most likely going to dissolve in water quite readily because it can actually hydrogen bond with water itself. Now, pH3, it's a polar molecule, but it doesn't have that N, O, or F in it, so it's probably not going to dissolve quite as readily into water. Take a look at the answer. It says ammonia, NH3, can hydrogen bond with water because its central nitrogen atom is both small and very electronegative. pH3 only has weak attractions to water. It cannot hydrogen bond to water because the phosphorus atom is larger and is not nearly as electronegative as nitrogen. So think about that as we think about solubility as well. Now, let's take a look at this little exercise here. Let's rank the following compounds in order of increasing boiling point. Now, you might remember that at the lowest boiling point, we're generally going to have London dispersion forces, and that would be something that uh, is a nonpolar molecule that would have only London dispersion forces. Well, the only nonpolar molecule I see here is carbon dioxide. If you were to draw out the Lewis diagram for that, you'd see that it is perfectly nonpolar. It has no lopsidedness to it. So carbon dioxide has the lowest boiling point. Now, I see a molecule that has a polar structure here, NO2. So that's going to be next. That has 
both London dispersion forces and dipole-dipole. So NO2 is next. And then water is going to be the highest because water has London dispersion forces and hydrogen bonding water is going to be the highest boiling point of those three. And if you were to Google these, you'd find that, yes, we are absolutely correct in our predictions of the boiling points. Carbon dioxide has a fairly low boiling point, NO2 is kind of in the middle, and then water is by far the highest of these three. Now, let's take a look at another type of force. These are called ionic forces. Now, technically, these are not intermolecular forces because ionic compounds are not molecules, so sometimes we call these interparticle forces. Now, to think about ionic forces, let's imagine a chunk of magnesium oxide. And we know that ionic compounds are not found in molecules. They're found in these repeating lattices, basically. So in the case of magnesium oxide, we'd have a magnesium ion followed by an oxide ion followed by magnesium. It's in this very uh, nice orderly array essentially. And the fact is that these ions stick together because of ionic forces. And ionic forces are basically just electrostatic forces. The fact that we have positive ions and negative ions that stick together very well because of the uh, separation of charges there. They stick together and that actually uh, holds the substance together. Now, of the four that we've talked about so far, London dispersion forces, dipole-dipole uh, forces, hydrogen bonding, and ionic forces now. The fact is ionic forces are generally the strongest of these. So we say that ionic compounds have the highest melting point and boiling point of the compounds that we normally work with. And so to review, we can say that ionic forces are at the top there. And just like we learned back in unit two, if you have two compounds that are ionic and you have to figure out which one has the higher melting point, you look at the charge differential. You know, a plus two minus two is normally gonna have a, a stronger force and a higher melting point than a plus one minus one. If it's a tie there, then we look at ionic size. Uh, cesium and bromide are pretty large ions. They're gonna have weaker uh, inter, uh, particle forces than you know sodium and fluoride ions, but both of those pairs are plus one minus one. Uh, hydrogen bonds are next. Uh, once again, if you see that HF bond, HO bond, or HN bond, it's hydrogen bonding. Dipole dipole forces are a little bit lower there. They're polar molecules, and then at the bottom we have London dispersion forces. And like we said in the last video, generally speaking, if you have two nonpolar molecules, the one that has more electrons, a, a larger electron cloud basically, is going to be more polarizable and is going to have stronger London dispersion forces. So to take all of this information here and put it all together, let's take uh, these different compounds and let's state which type of intermolecular forces we're going to have. So HNO3, well, if you were to draw this out, you'd see that it has hydrogen bonding. It has hydrogen bonding. Of course, it has London dispersion forces as well, because everything has London dispersion forces. If we have barium sulfate, well, it's an ionic compound, isn't it? So it's going to have primarily ionic forces. Yeah, it, it does have London dispersion forces, probably uh, not nearly uh, as significant as the ionic forces in this substance, though. How about CH4? Well, we've drawn this a few times already, haven't we? We know that this molecule is a nonpolar molecule, so it has only London dispersion forces, being a nonpolar molecule. How about NF3, nitrogen trifluoride? Well, if you draw that out, you see that it is a polar molecule. It has a trigonal pyramidal structure. It is a polar molecule. So it's going to have London dispersion forces like everything does, but it's also going to have dipole-dipole forces. So we can take any substance essentially and predict which type of intermolecular or interparticle forces are going to be present here. Now let's take this one step further. Let's take those same four substances we just looked at and let's rank them in order of increasing boiling point. So the bottom, the one that's going to have the least or the lowest boiling point, is going to be the one with only London dispersion forces. So methane, CH4, is the lowest. What's next? Well, it's dipole-dipole forces. So that would be NF3. 
Nitrogen trifluoride has the dipole dipole. That's that's next highest. And what's higher than that? Well, it will be hydrogen bonding. So that's HNO3 is a little bit higher. And then the highest boiling point would be the ionic compound, which is barium sulfate. So we can take these uh, substances and these forces here, and we can predict not just the forces that they're going to have, also we can rank their boiling points with pretty good accuracy as well. Now we're going to take a look at another type of force here that's also pretty important. And this happens when we have an ionic compound dissolving into a polar molecule. Usually that polar molecule is water. Now let's say we have this ionic compound here. Let's imagine it's salt, sodium chloride, or, or something like that. We have that nice, pretty, repeating lattice here on this ionic compound. But what's going to happen when you try to dissolve this into water? Well, we know that water molecules are going to surround those individual ions. Now, if that purple ion there is a sodium cation, perhaps it's got a positive charge, well, we know that the negative poles of water are going to surround that. That's how it works. Opposite charges attract. The negative pole of water is going to be attracted to the positive ions in that crystal right there. And that attraction that we have between ions in an ionic compound and polar molecules, usually water, this is called an ion-dipole force. And this works for negative ions as well. If we have this negative ion over here, perhaps this is an ion of, I don't know, chloride possibly, and we have water molecules, they're going to surround them just like this, where we have the negative anion in the crystal being surrounded by the positive poles of the water molecules opposite charges attract. These are ion dipole forces. Now, we know that if you drop this ionic compound into water, the molecules are going to surround it, just like we see here, but that ionic compound is only going to dissolve if that ion dipole force is greater than the force holding those ions together in the compound. In the case of sodium chloride, salt, you know that salt dissolves in water very well. So we know that in the case of salt, sodium chloride, the ion dipole force that we see right here is indeed stronger than the ionic forces holding this crystal together. Now in a lot of ionic compounds, that's not the case. The ionic forces holding the compound together are actually stronger than the ion dipole force. And in that case, the crystal is going to be insoluble. And so ion dipole forces are pretty important when we talk about ionic compounds dissolving into water. Now there are other things that dissolve into water as well. We know that sometimes nonpolar molecules can dissolve in water as well. Like for example, carbon dioxide dissolves very easily in water. And we know that carbon dioxide is not a polar molecule. It's very nonpolar. So why does this work? Well, it's another type of force. Let's imagine we have a bunch of carbon dioxide molecules here floating around, and then we all of a sudden drop this into water, and we have some water molecules nearby. Well, we can actually find an attractive force between these nonpolar molecules like carbon dioxide and the polar molecules of water. They are attracted to this uh, polar molecule here and they start to line up and then they get attracted to water and carbon dioxide actually does dissolve in water quite well. And this is called a dipole induced dipole force. Now this is not one that appears very commonly on the AP exam, but it is on the curriculum so you do need to know about it. And this is an attractive force between some uh, nonpolar molecules like carbon dioxide and very polar molecules like water. So here we have the dipole induced dipole force. Hey, there's a lot in this video to learn about. We have to know about all those intermolecular and, and interparticle forces. Hey, hope you learned something. If you did, please slam that thumbs up button, that like button. I would really appreciate it. I hope to see you in the next video where we're going to jump right into topic 3.2. I'll see you in that video. Thanks for watching.